Hey folks, it's Joe, aka the Beardy Wine Guy here. Uh, welcome to the second part of our uh, of our video series, a Beginner's Guide to French Wine. Uh, it's basically a two-parter about why we call Bordeaux wines, the reds in particular, claret. <laughs> Um, now, we left you with uh, lots of claret, just to see the pronunciation difference, claret, tons and tons and tons of it making its way back to the UK. Um, but the quality still isn't very good. It's pretty poor, in fact, um, and not what we'd expect of Bordeaux wines nowadays. You know, the, uh, the very complex wines that age beautifully, you know, develop and soften and, and, and produce lots of secondary and tertiary flavours. Now, during the late 16th century, um, much of the winemaking in Bordeaux was centred around the, uh, the south part of the city. So over the river on the south part of the city. Uh, it's also known as the left bank of the Garonne River. Um, and if any of this isn't uh, ringing any bells, make sure to check out part one where you can see where we're talking about the geography of the area. Now, um, the, a, a very, very famous region, uh, which is probably the birthplace of all kind of Bordeaux wines as we know it, is called Grave. It's spelled G-R-A-V-E-S, Grave. Um, mainly known because it had lots of gravelly soil uh, grave gravel but you can see the connection can't you you know a lot of our a lot of our words are influenced by french words and things like that because you know they came over and invaded yada 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 and uh, things came into common parlance um so to the north of the city the right bank as it's known as and you'll probably hear about this when people are talking about bordeaux wines the right bank uh, is where some of the most famous appellations the famous little regions areas are nowadays um it was it was unusable it was a swampy marshland you couldn't grow anything on it vines would have rotted in the soil um until uh, the beginning of the 17th century 17th century because bordeaux and the dutch um had a a kind of a late relationship regarding wine they called over some engineers from holland um from the netherlands if you want to get like that. Netherlands, um, they came over and they were masters at draining and making uh, land usable. You've only got to look at their work with the uh, the dikes. I hear you sniggering at the back, Jenkins. None of that. Um, so in Holland, they have a lot of low-lying land where a lot of it had been retaken by the sea uh, and they did some amazing stuff to drain and make it usable again. So the Dutch engineers went in and what they found was that the soil there was very similar to the the stuff on the uh, left bank, on the south of the city. Pretty infertile, but very gravelly. And um, uh, vines really, really love kind of well-draining, minerally soil um, with little or no nutrients. Uh, and that way that the vine doesn't overproduce and... Um, uh, the best land can generally, the, the most fertile land, can be used for farming. Once this had happened, the, the winemaking and the quality of the, the, the grape growing um, vastly improved. The quality vastly improved. Uh, and also some new winemaking techniques were being brought in as well. So, you know, there was um, picking the best quality grapes, not overgrowing them on the vine, uh, and using new French oak barrels, uh, which really, really boosted the quality and complexity of the wine itself. It was deeper in colour, there was way more flavour, and it could age. Grave had similar soils, but they favoured the, uh, the cheap... Um, claret uh, because you know money talks and if you're able to pump out loads and loads of wine <clears throat> at uh, reduced prices you're still gonna make a lot of money now enter the hero of our piece uh, this was a French chap uh, in and around the 17th century he's known as Arno de Pontac Arno de Pontac fabulous looking fella uh, big fan of him uh, he was a wealthy landowner who he saw a future um, in producing wines that were um, 
expensive and showed status and showed how good his land was. He was a pioneer in this sort of respect. He believed in his product um, and he was going to show them to be items of luxury and, and status symbols for the, for the wealthy. Um, he did this in a couple of ways. He was very clever. So firstly, um, wines from the vignerons, those are, that's a word for French winemakers, um, were basically, uh, they were sold to the Bordeaux wine merchants. So it went from the vineyard to the, the Bordeaux wine merchants. Now the wine merchants uh, never used to sell the wines under the winemaker's name because why would they? It's got nothing to do with them. Um, uh, and what they would then do is blend together all the wines with no thought for preserving the, the, the idea of terroir or anything like that. They would just mix and match it all together, stamp it with their name and send it out into the world. And Arnaud de Pontac went, I'm not having any of this. Get out of here. So what he did was he raised his prices, vastly raised his prices by about three times the normal amount. And when the Bordeaux winemakers saw this, they were like, yeah, I, we, we can't really afford to buy a load of uh, cheap stuff and blend it with the expensive stuff. We'll keep the expensive stuff as it is. So he was very, very clever um, at preserving the product that he was sending out. He, he outthought the merchants, which I really like. Um, and secondly was branding. He wanted his his product, his name, to be talked about wherever it went. So he uh, came up with um, stamping all of his barrels with uh, the name of his estate, which was Aubryon. Um, and what he did is he built a big, lovely house um, and it, a house in kind of one of those big grand houses is a chateau. So he was one of the, the progenitors of the chateau movement. And nowadays you hear chateau, blah, blah, blah in France, you know, it's going to be, you know, something quite fancy. He was the one that came up with that. Um, so the name was on people's lips uh, outside of France, right? Don't believe me. Don't believe he came up with it. Well, here's an example. In 1663, our old mucker, Samuel Pepys, the Adrian Mole of his day, uh, he was uh, kind of a, one of the first modern wine tasters and taking wine tasting notes. He loved his wine when he could afford it. Uh, and he used to drink a lot of claret. Um, but he, uh, he wrote in his diary a, a really, really telling piece about the quality of the Aubryon that he was tasting. Uh, and these are his words. Drank a sort of French wine uh, called Brian that hath a good and most particular taste that I ever met with. I mean, he may have got the name wrong, but he knew the name, he knew around the name, Hobrian, Aubryon. Um, so it, people, people, this was Arno de Pontac's scheme and it worked fantastically. Um, now, again, this jug of wine that Peeps was buying was three times the amount that a jug of claret would, would, would cost. Um, it's a testament to the strategy that he employed, so give it up for Arno de Pontac. Now by the end of the 17th century, England, English kind of uh, ability to get hold of wine, again, got a bit difficult because, again, we were fighting with France. Why couldn't the kids just put down their toys and play nice? Um, there were heavy custom duties for wine going into uh, for wine going out of France and into England, um, and uh, so the quality of the new French claret, which is what it was known as, the the red deep stuff was known as new French claret. Um, it it had to be very high quality to justify the price that people were going to pay for it. And over time, the, the new style, the, the new French claret style, was adopted by all winemakers because they knew it, it was actually more profitable than to knock out loads of cheap stuff. Um, so the name claret eventually went from poor man's tipple to, uh, to the drink of the wealthy, mainly down to uh, Mr. Arnaud de Pontac. Um, amazing. 
Uh, now you got to remember that Bordeaux is not just for money bags anymore. It's for everyone. You can get wines priced from just above £10 all the way up to, hey, the sky's the limit. Um, and I'd really recommend that you go out and try them. So check out bottleswineshop.co.uk uh, or go into the shop, the, the physical shop, if, you, if you're in and around Worcester, and go and check out this fabulous array of Bordeaux that we've got in, uh, in and over Christmas. Um, also scope out uh, social media, both for the bar uh, and for myself. Uh, we'll put it all in the description down below. Um, and again, most of all, stay safe, look after each other, and uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Ciao for now.